So it is with great pleasure that I present to you Carter Phipps, an integral thinker, a visionary, a writer, a business futurist and evolutionary. Um, he is also the co-author of the Wall Street Journal bestseller, Conscious Leadership, author of Evolutionaries, the book I, I love, and co-founder of the Institute for uh, Cultural Evolution. So Carter, thank you so much for being here and welcome to our program. Well, thanks so much. It's a delight to be here. I'm glad we were able to make it work. Yes, of course. So before we dive into into the various aspects of uh, the wisdom in your books. I would like to know something very personal. What took you to this journey of being an integral thinker, a visionary, a force for good? What happened in your life? Uh, that's a good question. I guess that's a very good question. I mean, I, 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 I hope I'm a force for good. I guess we all try to be forces for good. <laughs> I don't know if we all succeed. Um, yeah, I, I think for me it was uh, it was th there was a there was a sort of deep um, from my from really from my teenage years and my collegiate years, I had a very strong sort of you know this uh, spiritual uh, yearning and a kind of a spiritual path I, I wanted to follow, and I sort of in my in my early, early adult years, I, I pursued that with great intensity. And I sort of, you know, imagine wanting to sort of achieve and, and work at least to try to achieve the, sort of the highest levels of human potential. I think I was very inspired by the human potential movement of the 60s and 70s, and some of the Eastern spirituality of that era. So there was this great desire to sort of to reach as high as I could personally and and, and, and so I pursued that, but, and I think through that journey, I eventually sort of found my way into integral philosophy and into, uh, and into thinking about more than just, you know, individual achievement, individual potential, individual enlightenment, quote unquote, but started to think more about culture and, uh, and think more about uh, the different aspects of culture and to think more about, you know, my, my original degree was in economics. So I always had an interest in business and markets. So that was always a thread. But as I began to think more about the collective future of, 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 of all of us and of, of, of different cultures and of our global culture, I think the, the, the interest in business and markets and, and, and because it's such a critical part of how we go forward and how we create a future that's really the future we want, because that's so such a keystone. I think I got more and more interested in that over time. So, so anyway, that's, was a, it that's a, a very very quick yeah. explanation. Yeah. So was it more of a cognitive uh, development, or was it anything emotional or psychological or psycho spiritual that happened in your life, like a a wake up call that occurred. It doesn't have to be. I'm just curious. No. <laughs> well, there was a number of there was a number of things. I mean, that, you know, over in, in the 90s, in my 20s, I was in a spiritual community and I was doing a lot of spiritual practice and in, in a, co a collective spiritual community where we were doing a lot of inquiry. And there, there was a, you know, a very cognitive part of it. And, and I was reading, you know, I was always super interested and in, in sort of an intellectual generalist. And I was always reading a lot about all kinds of things. And, but, but the practice of, of that community was, was, was individual and, and also collective, you know, small groups of deep inquiry. So in some ways it was more psycho-spiritual. It was trying to understand uh, myself more deeply doing meditation practice, trying to reach through these higher levels of sort of consciousness and trying to understand the, the, the potential of consciousness at an individual level, at a collective level and pursuing that uh, initially through more of an Eastern lens uh, and meditation and, and sort of Eastern uh, inquiry. But over time, you know, uh, that sort of evolved as well. So uh, yeah, so in some ways, I guess it was probably the initial was this kind of deep spiritual yearning and pursuing sort of the emotional and spiritual depths of myself and with a small group, small groups of people. And then over time, I think in my late 20s and 30s, uh, I think the cognitive aspect, you know, I've always, I've always, you know, 
was a good student, I had, had, had intellectual potential. But in my 20s, it was really, I, you know, in some ways I put that aside a bit. I mean, I was still interested in all kinds of things. But it was in my 30s when I became editor of a magazine called What is Enlightenment and with a small group of people that were part of that community that were really pursuing, uh, you know, we, there was this kind of incredibly rich intellectual inquiry of, in, that, in that period. Uh, and we sort of discovered uh, some of the shared philosophy that we share, integral philosophy, but, it, but even beyond that, it was just a very rich, it was a real cognitive awakening. So that was in some ways more in my 30s um, that, 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 that happened. And so uh, I think it was always sort of, you know, it just wasn't as online in my 20s. So it was a mixture. I think at different points in my life, it was different. At times it was more psycho-spiritual. At times it was more cognitive. It, it, it varied, you know. Your gift is writing uh, in a in a beautifully in enlightening and informative and and actually brilliant brilliant way of communicating complex things in a in a simple manner so that people can embrace uh, the truth and uh, one of your my favorite, one of my favorite books, and um, actually, I don't know, one of your books is uh, that I'm holding up here is uh, called uh, Evolutionaries, Unlocking the Spiritual and Cultural Potential of Science's Greatest Idea. How does your personal path toward later stages of development connect with, with your decision to write this book? And by the way, what is an evolutionary? Very good question, all of it. I mean, I went through this, the, you know, that era that I described in my life where I, you know, my 20s, I, I had on one hand, I was pursuing my own spiritual path and the spiritual path of this community with as much fervor and intensity as I could. And I was also, I had a, I had a career in the tech industry at the time, right, as the dot-com era was sort of you know, starting to go, uh, you know, exponential in the late 90s. And so I was very, you know, I was interested in technology and business. And then I became an editor of this magazine. And right around that time, um, I, I and, and the people we were working with felt like we sort of, I don't know, at the time, sort of stumbled on or discovered a whole new way of thinking about the world and about development and that sort of combined culture and science and spirituality and and consciousness and human development and and any other domains as well and uh and over the next decade i and you know a number of other people as well but i i, I felt like I, I explored that as deeply as i could and the evolutionaries was sort of a book that came out of that era of my life and so uh, it was uh, felt like I awoke, awoke to a new way of seeing the world, a new worldview in a sense, and a new that sort of went back into history and was a new way of thinking about the future. And it was like the whole uh, sort of psycho, spiritual, cultural, biological, cosmological evolution of history, of the world, of culture and even of cosmology, even of, uh, you know, really came online. And I felt like this is a, this, this way of thinking about the future was, was profound. And so, and, and along with that came a number of theorists and, and, and visionaries who I found great inspiration in. And so I wanted to feature their work as well. And so Evolutionaries was kind of my own awakening to that era but it was also featuring a lot of the great uh, thinkers and visionaries who were sort of contributing to that. And so, yeah, so uh, I think that's where that book sort of arose out of. So it was kind of the culmination of that, of that era of my life, I think. So this program is catered to, to capital, capital owners, capital right. users, capital, <laughs> capital. Not capital, cosmological capital. evolution. <laughs> It's a business and investing with the intention to turn our 
and I think there is no doubt about it, are unsustainable uh, systems that we currently uh, um, are having or experiencing around in a way that we could ensure the future of life. I summarize that sure. as how can we apply the UN SDGs within planetary boundaries, given the fact that those planetary boundaries have left their secure boundary. Yeah. So right. one of the business, the biggest issues in society is not the lack of capital, but lack of higher level of consciousness. And you spoke about it um, with respect in, in, within the context of your previous book. Your latest book is deals with conscious leadership. And yes. uh, you co-authored it with uh, uh, Whole Foods uh, 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 CEO and co-founder and with uh, Steve McIntosh. Why did you write that book? What what is the difference between conscious leadership and traditional leadership? And how does that yeah. work for, or can it work for us in order to, uh, to help us implement yeah. the UN SDGs yeah. within planetary boundaries? I know this is a, a mouthful, we could have to take hours, yeah. but give us three tenets of, um, that you're putting across. Great. Yeah. Let me, let me, before I get to that, let me just give a little background so listeners will understand. I, I think one of those, one of the insights that came out of evolutionaries in, in that era, that, that era in my, the book was, was an appreciation for the last 250 years of human history. And, and what I mean by is, is, you know, an appreciation for how cultures evolved over time, you know, and we've gone through these different eras of culture. And they've each contributed something to the human condition. Maybe that's been very important. And they each has, has some real downsides. Obviously, we, we're very familiar with the downsides of a lot of our history, right? So that's no, but, but sometimes I think we, we sometimes fail to appreciate the upsides. And one of the things I sort of began to realize as I sort of understood, as I, as I sort of awoke to this new perspective and as I began to be more historically informed is, and I think a lot of, it is how much the last 250 years of human history, which is really the dawning of the modern world, but also the dawning of markets and capitalism and, and industrialization, and how much that's uplifted the human race and, and human history, how important that's been, the amount of dramatic change. We live in worlds where we forget we have how the world was 100 years ago, much less 500 years ago. I mean, you know, you don't have to read much history to be completely shocked, you know, just to, to face the reality of change that's happened in the last couple few hundred years, right? So just tremendous dramatic. And I think even a lot, and so you can say that's capitalism, you can say it's markets, industrialization, technology, you can apply it to all kinds of reasons, but the amount of change that's happened, I think we just kind of, sometimes we have to sit back and just appreciate how much our life has improved. The fact that we can even have this conversation in the middle of a pandemic, you know, I mean, things like that are just extraordinary. So I, now along with that has come extraordinary challenges, right? We, environmental challenges, climate challenges, we have all kinds of, the, the, you know, those, those haven't come at, at for, for free. They've come at a cost. And that cost is what we're dealing with now. And that cost is how, when we think of the future and we think of a bright, sustainable future, we're a lot dealing with the, the downsides of that, all that transformation and all that change, right? Um, so, so how do we deal with that? How do we do that? And so part of, part of the, the what, what John Mackey, the founder of Whole Foods, started with was the he wrote a book called Conscious Capitalism, trying to say, okay, capitalism, instead of saying capitalism is this kind of thing we, you know, uh, we, we sort of don't want to talk about at parties, you know, <laughs> kind of thing, you know, which a lot of people have, and says saying it's like something we should kind of get rid of or keep in the back room or let's not, let's, let's acknowledge its positives, but also acknowledge that it needs to evolve. It needs to be upgraded. It needs to go through its own transformation. So that was the book that came out of a number of years ago. And that book has really started the whole movement uh, that, that sort of uplifts the heart of the idea of markets and capitalism, but acknowledges it needs to be you know, significantly upgraded. And so in some ways, conscious leadership was the sequel to that. It was the same, if we're going to have a, 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 a financial system and a capital system that works for the next generations, it needs 
uh, leadership. It needs a different type of leadership. And so conscious leadership is an effort to speak to that, really, to speak to that issue. So that's kind of, and, and I think the difference between a traditional leader and a conscious leader, and you ask it, is in some, in many respects, it's, it's that, uh, you know, there have been tremendous leaders in in world and in, in, in the in the last you know in, in the world obviously and some leaders are, some great leaders are born, and and some people are natural leaders they just are they they grow up and they become good leaders but conscious leadership is about taking on the idea of yourself as a leader, investigating inquiring and trying to really consciously evolve yourself as a leader so you're not depending upon you know, whether or not you were born a good leader or a decent leader or just are naturally a, a, a good or bad leader, that we can actually evolve and develop in our adult lifetimes as leaders. We can really change. We can have an impact on how we are. But to do that, we have to consciously engage with leadership as an idea in all kinds of ways. We have to learn and develop and grow as individuals, as leaders. And our capital systems, our market systems, our business systems need us to do that. They need us to be more informed, more developed, more profound, reach higher levels of potential and consciousness. And so we can we can be the kind of leaders that the world needs, you know, for the next next generation. So that's kind of the idea. Brilliant. So where do we start? How do we become <laughs> a conscious leader? And I don't want to go into the conversation of uh, defining consciousness, which would probably would have to be addressed. So we'll do that on, on the next call. <laughs> it's a whole nother thing. But in terms of leadership, let's say, you know, we all agree on the fact that we need to do something about it. And if you are an awakened person, like, yes, awakened to the fact that we need to do something about it. Let's say you are going to uh, speak to Ursula von der Leyen, you know, the head of the EU commission. What kind, what are the three areas that she should be addressing uh, coming from a conscious leadership perspective in order to achieve her goals and, and uh, put the European Union on the path to sustainable, a sustainable world, ensuring the future of life and transforming the system th that we need, you know, starting with the financial system, with the business system, with the, the way we measure success uh, yeah, and so on. Sure. Where would you start? Well, in the book, uh, I'll, I'll start with a book and then maybe we can go to that question. I mean, in the book, we, we, our first chapter is called Put Purpose First, you know, so obviously that's so, so significant. I know there's been, uh, you know, a hundred thousand leadership books written about purpose, so, you know, but nevertheless, nevertheless, understanding like where the arrow is pointing, understanding where you're trying to go, you know, not that we're going to have some perfect vision of the future or perfect vision, but understanding what motivates you and I to get out of bed in the morning, what motivates us to do the things we do, what do we care deeply about, and what do the organizations and institutions that we work for, that we're part of, care deeply about whether the na what's the you know whether the na what's the nation what's the eu care deeply about what what is it trying to achieve as its per institutional organizational purpose so at all those levels you know un understanding that making sure that the purpose is aligned with where we actually want to go is a huge part of, of any any conversation like that so so it's no surprise purpose is is a is a is a fundamental tenet of the book but the next one's not so uh, not so the next two in the book aren't so common perhaps in 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 business mission statements one is with lead with love and one is act always act with integrity and and are we you know are we putting our best selves forward as leaders are we leading with a kind of heart centered approach that that is that is uh, that can really have a difference on those the, the people around us that can really demonstrate a different kind of of care, a different kind of humanity, and a different kind of, of business. You know, we're 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 often we're so used to these kind of um, like in the book we talk about the Darwinian metaphors of capitalism, the win lose metaphors. You know that it's all just like this kind of competition, and we're just trying to defeat the other the other guy, the other team, it's all, it's all kind of framed in a win-lose mindset. But how do we develop uh, a different kind of way of thinking about business, a different kind of way of thinking about the institutions that we're part of, a kind of win-win. In, in the book, we actually have a, another, a, 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 one of our principles is a win-win-win, meaning I, how do we develop 
solutions where different elements and different stakeholders in this in the in the situation we're in can all win together you know is that possible how do we do that are we thinking about that uh where i win where you win where the community around us wins so at the eu level or the institutional level are we trying to develop the the solutions where different stakeholders really win them win now everyone's not gonna win perfectly people always will lose in in different ways i understand there are there are there are inevitable trade-offs to big decisions big political decisions but in some fundamental way can we develop solutions that are win-win so in 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 america right now you know we are we're in a win-lose era of our political history and it's just it's it's kind of horrible you know if if one side believes in this I have to not believe in that. If my side believes in this, I have to not believe in the other thing. I mean, it's just incredible. It's like you can almost any issue starts to get divided up by left and right, by blue and red. Uh, you know, you you can, and it's very hard to, to create solutions that that can work and move the society forward. We're in that kind of polarized state. It's just it, it, it creates a very difficult situation. So getting ourselves in a kind of a win-win mindset. And, you know, when we talk about, you know, integral, we talked about integral philosophy and one of its insights is that there are these different cultural worldviews that are present in a society. There's traditional worldviews. We talk about modern worldviews or postmodern worldviews or different ways of thinking, different values, different ways of organizing our values, right? So in America, we have, you know, there's all, there's in a way, maybe not true in Europe, parts of Europe, there's very strong religious worldviews, traditional religious worldviews. And you have to take those into account, for example, and how, so you need to develop solutions that can both move the society forward, but also provide authentic wins for those different worldviews, whether it's the business community, the religious community, the sustainability community, the environmental community. Can you develop solutions that actually provide authentic wins for those different societies, for those different little micro societies, but that also move us forward, that aren't just regressive or punt the ball down the field, you know, and sort of not make hard decisions now and put them off to the future, you know? So can you do that? Can you develop when that, that's a huge challenge for our political future. And right now we don't even seem to be able to, you know, believe in anything that the, my tribe doesn't believe, you know, we just, we just seem so tribal. And I think the tribal forces sort of ripping at sort of the, the national fabric in America, at least, and, and it's probably less true in Europe, but I think there's some of those forces as well. It's, it's, it's painful, it's difficult, but it's something that we have to envision a way out of. And maybe we're not going to get to that for the next five or 10 years. But when the, when things turn, we have to be ready to, to provide that leadership because it's a, you know, we, we, you know, you never, you know, politics are unpredictable. You know, I, we started the, my nonprofit, the, 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 that I co-founded the Institute for Cultural Evolution. We said, you know, six, seven years ago, polarization is going to get worse before it gets better. You know, uh, political polarization is going to get worse before it gets better, at least in America. And, and it has, and it, and it may still get worse, but at some point it's going to turn. And, and can we envision the kind of future that when it starts to turn, we're really ready to move and develop the solutions where the society can move forward very, very fast. That would be ideal. Hallelujah. <laughs> <laughs> the next question is we, we can only achieve what we measure. So on one hand, and as an economist, you know that more than anybody else. Uh, so currently we have one measurement criterion that is dominating the world that is for profit, for profit in business, finances, finances uh, dominates everything. Yeah. When it comes to transformation, the transformation of conscious leadership, how can we integrate factors such as the purpose that you outlined uh, with, with the planet, uh, yeah. with the financial sustainability, which is just as important. I'm not, a, I'm not somebody who says, oh, we should drop uh, uh, financial sustainability altogether. We don't need that. We just would be naive. So we need yeah. an integrated way of, uh, of uh, defining what, we, what the outcome should be and measuring the outcome on a regular yes. basis yes. alongside certain benchmarks that we, you know, you mentioned the integral theory, which is I'm a, I'm a pro, pro, uh, proponent thereof, but uh, there could be some other 
uh, less convoluted or less complex criterion. So what would be from, from a conscious leadership perspective, what would be measurement criteria that could be implemented and easily achieve, achievable? You know, yeah, not good question. That, yeah. Well, good question. I mean, I, like you say, things we care about. I think it starts with the what we care about. And then you have to find ways to measure what you care about to the extent that you can, you know, but, but I think from a, from a, from a, like a conscious leadership perspective, the first step I think is realizing it is, is dislodging profit from being at the center of the purpose of business. I think that's the thing. And I think the way we do that is not say, well, you know, profit is the core of business, but it shouldn't be, which is how a lot of people think, you know, like profit is at the core of business, but it should, but, but, but somehow that's bad to realizing that that profit isn't the core of business. You know, you know it's obviously sometimes it's important, as you say, and maybe for some people that is their focus. I acknowledge that. But if one of the points we make in the book is that, you know, most great entrepreneurs, most great businesses are not founded just so they can just make money. They're just, that's just not true. And most great businesses are founded or most great in organizations and institutions. If you look back to their history, they're usually founded because of the passion of a certain founder. He wanted to innovate in a certain way or to do something, to create something, to build something, to have a certain kind of impact. And yeah, profits and are part of that picture, but they're not sent. They're not the central part of it. You know, innovation and technology and and, and the, the, the evolution of business over the last hundred years hasn't been driven just by this desire to make a buck. You know, it's also been driven by this incredible, you know, ingenuity and creativity. And, and, and I think the more we, we recognize that, the more we stop to think that somehow profits are at the center of our scheme here. And when we think profits are at the center of the scheme, then we, then either, we either, you get, you get this polar, this polarization where you have people defending it on one hand and you see, I see, you know, capitalists and market people all the time talking about profit, defending the sanctity of that on one hand and, and sort of people on the other side uh, decrying it as the worst thing in the world and being against all, all of that, being against capitalism for all those reasons. And I think they're both wrong because I don't think that's what is at the core of it. And I think so the more we recognize that, I think the better off we are in being able to see more clearly where we're, where we're, where we're headed. So in some ways, I think that's the sort of the, the foundation is to recognize profits are, are, are important and critical, but it's about what we're trying to create in the world, the impact we're trying to have, what is our institution trying to do? What are we trying to do? And focus on that, align ourselves toward that. And then as you say, start to whatever those, that purpose is, if that, then, then measure those things. Try to measure the impact we're having in relationship to our purpose, in relationship to our, our highest sense of purpose and our highest sense of our institution's purpose. And prof, if we're not making any profits, obviously it's very hard to, for, a, for a business institution to go on. So they're important, but, but are we measuring what is actually central to the endeavor of the organization institution itself? You know, So that's kind of- Right, so if we- maximize profits at the expense of the people and the planet that cannot be a long-term solution that uh, it, ensures- No, it, it, it's not a solution at all. You can't maximize, yeah, it, it's not a solution at all. And obviously sometimes people do that. And that's a, that's a short, that's a kind of a short, a, a, a negative short-termism that both undermines the society ultimately. And, but it also undermines, I would argue, I mean, maybe not in every case. I'm sure there's examples of people where they made tons of money just doing what they want to do and trying to make as much money as they can. But usually it undermines the vibe, the long-term viability organization itself because they lose track of whatever was the value creation activity of that organization was not just to make more money. It was to build something, to create something, to, to have an impact on their customers, to have, you know, and if they're not, if you're not doing that well, you usually undermine the long-term viability of the, of the, of the company. And you can see that in a lot of companies, right? We've seen that in some, some huge institutions where they've sort of lot, they, they, they just started to focus on financial metrics. I mean, look in America, you can see GE or a company like that, where they get so, focus on financial metrics and they completely lose track of what they're trying to build as an organization. And then they, and, you know, and, and it seems good for, it seems great briefly, you know, and usually of the long term, it's a disaster. So. 
Yes, and I, I've uh, used in, in many of my papers, uh, I refer to Whole Foods as an example and conscious capitalism as a sure, philosophy, yeah. as, as an example for that kind of mind shift and, and necessary transformation at the corporate level, not, not uh, planetary wide. So that brings us to the mind shift, the necessary mind shift. Now that we know that uh, what needs to occur how yeah. do we and, and how do we achieve that mind shift both uh, at an individual level and i know john Mackey and you guys are at, uh, are integral thinkers and uh but also at the at, at the cultural level at the government level and and then eventually planetary so that mind shift what are the fault lines um the, yeah. of the current mind shift and what should be the future orientation? What are the acupuncture points? Yeah, that is a great question. Uh, we could have a whole whole uh, whole podcast on that question. I mean, it's a it's a. Uh, I mean, I I think there are a lot of important acupuncture points, and I think you know for those of us in in these conversations and who have the time and space and sort of economic possibility of having these kinds of conversations, you know, we're we're trying to we're trying to think at a you know we're trying to think at a not just an individual level or familiar familial level we're trying to think about the, the countries we live in and how to involve them and we're we're also trying to think of the global centric level right to try to to try to you know and not just you know cognitively imagine the world I think when listeners they may hear that wrong but trying to th- you know, part of it is trying to identify as a human being with this, the whole project we're part of as a, as a society, as a global society, you know, where we care about the success of the global society. There's something about like connecting to that and having an emotional, a psycho-emotional connection to that, to that world, as well as to our own lives and our families and our communities and et cetera, et cetera, but actually have a, a, a connection to that larger global society there's something about that that awakens in our own consciousness when we start to have that kind of connection and we care about about that future and so that that in and of itself to to have an a sort of empathetic connection to that global centric mind and society is a is a is itself an important thing and some of us have the opportunity to develop that in ourselves and we should but not every uh not everyone in the world has that potential and you can see you know, not everyone can have, is having these conversations. And some people are in very different places in their, you know, uh, in their, in, in their development. And, and we have to acknowledge that as well. So I think, I mean, we're, we, we, we're in a, in this, uh, uh, you know, in, in a, I like to say in, in, I'll just, you know, I'll talk about, I'll step back from the globe for a moment and talk about, America, and I think it's to some degree true in Europe as well. But we have these two great sort of transitions that are happening in the world. And one is this move from a more traditional society, uh, a more religious society, to the kind of a, mo- a more modern era, to from a more, tra- often more traditionally religious in all kinds of ways, into the, what we think of as the sort of modernity in a modern world in the way that has sort of been pioneered maybe by the West of the last couple of centuries, but it's not, it's not just something in the West now, it's something all over the world, right? You see that happening in China, you see that happening in the Middle East, you see that happening, that, that tension, and that's a tremendous tension point in the world right now. And we see, we see wars and insurrections and all kinds of things break out over that tension point in that transition, because there's all these reactions and counter reactions in that, in that transition, right? So that, that traditional to modern transition, but in, but in 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 Germany and in the U.S. there is another transition, and we see that in in America right now. You see that very strongly. It's this transition between the the modern world and democracy and capitalism into what we might call this kind of postmodern era, and the postmodern era is defined, you know, by a kind of environmental awareness. Uh, a way of thinking about often it's very it can be very anti-capitalist it can be very anti-modern it can be but it, it's very concerned with environmentalism it's very concerned with social justice these social justice movements that broke out across the world over the last 
year or, or an expressions of that, right? So there's this kind of tension, just like there was in the previous, there was this tension between these traditional modern, there's this massive tension in, in America, certainly, and to some degree in Europe, between all of these new values that are coming online, between social justice and environmental sustainability, and these kind of these these values and these more sort of modern values of economic growth and prosperity and creation of wealth and and all of these things which are important but now have to sort of take a take a, you know have to share the share the limelight with these new values so that tension between modernism what we what we might generally call modernism and postmodernism is, is equally fractious and contentious and subject to these reactions and counter reactions as that traditional modern transition is. So as we go through that modern postmodern transition, you know, how are we, can we, can we do that without fracturing as societies? You know, can without breaking down, without, without, uh, you know, uh, there's these tremendous kind of decentralizing forces right now in society. It wants us to kind of break apart into smaller and smaller groups. You know, uh, it would kind of want, it's kind of pull, ripping at the fabric of the nation state. It wants to kind of break apart into smaller and smaller, smaller tribes in many ways. So part of what our work is, you know, is to create an alliance so that mo that modern world and all it's good and bad that's created over the last, you know, 250 years. In that postmodern world and its new values that it seems is so important. I'm sorry, my cat here wants to be part of this conversation. Oh, how wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> I love cats. <laughs> I do too. <laughs> and that postmodern world that wants to be part of, that wants to, is coming online and says, no, we demand attention. We have to, you know, these things are important. Social justice is important. Environmental sustainability is important, you know. We have to have a human, more human-centered approach to all of these things. Those are right. Can we create an alliance between those two? Because if they go at each, if the, if those two worldviews go at each other's throat for the next fifty years, we're going to be in a lot of trouble as a society. We have to create pathways where they can get along. They can work together. Where we can work together as a society. Because if they if they don't, if we're stuck in a in a in a in a, in a culture war that in an endless culture war between those two, the society is going to have a lot of trouble over. We're not gonna be able to deal with the problems we need to deal with. We're not gonna be able to move forward in the ways we wanna move forward. So developing that alliance is so critical to the future. Which is the purpose of the European Union. As uh, from my perspective, uh, one of the most advanced societal projects of, uh, of the last 100 years. Right. Uh, and it, 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 it's not easy. We see how difficult it was, uh, even within the context of procuring Art. the vaccinations yeah. Yeah, for was, Europe. They, because they, was str they struggled with that. Yeah, they couldn't, you yeah. know, align themselves, um, you yeah. know, on, on, you know, ordering soon enough, recognizing the importance of being quick uh, and so on, because there's so many voices and so many different interests. So it is... Um, and yet I, I am a European and I am a big promoter and supporter of the European Commission. That's why I basically in the European Union. We can see all the forces trying to fracture the European Union out and to keep it from from integrating. Right. So how do you yeah. integrate and still maintain some of the some of the advantages of, of other levels of governance? You know, it's much easier to have some, you know, a, a kind of the Chinese party just tell you how to do it. But we don't want to go back to that. So how do we be effective at this higher level, right? Yes, absolutely. Which is the reason why I mentioned Ursula von der Leyen as, as a leader in this you know, conscious leadership context, because she is basically facing exactly the issues that you're trying to address uh, through this book. And um, uh, you know, the green growth and financing sustainable uh, growth and mm -hmm. coming up with admin, uh, you know, the taxonomy and the benchmarks and the disclosure criteria, transparency and so on is, is a big project, even if it's not complete or, you know, it mm -hmm. needs a lot of yeah. work. Yeah. And the Green Deal, you know, they're e extremely important. Uh, so yeah, steps yeah. toward the creating yeah. the civilization and preserving yeah. and evolving the civilization that yeah. We, uh, yeah. we all deserve. So it's uh, so, yeah. but that so brings critical. us to the shadow side. So, you know, when the mind needs to shift, we need to 
be able to address the shadows that, you know, and of course, one thing about shadows, we don't see them, they're all behind us. Yeah. So is, the, is this part of, um, of, of conscious leadership? Um, and I'm, I'm not trying to insist on that book. Um, you know, I, I would be more than happy to uh, hear more from the Institute of uh, Cultural Evolution and the work that you're doing there. Sure, and yeah, I get it. What can you give us, um, you know, and the audience of this are investors, business people, uh, people who really care about transformation and what can we do yeah. with the little that we have, with the little money that we have compared to the big one and with the little awareness that we have. Well, I think just like we, at an individual level, we have to become aware if we're going to be a conscious leader, we have to become aware, at least to some degree, as much as we can. We can't ignore the shadow sides of ourselves that are getting in the way of us being effective leaders, you know? So in, how, in do, how, way do that, we, how do we become a, a conscious leader? I mean, let's give a, can you give a, a concrete example? So, uh, you know, I managed to listen for 40 minutes to this podcast and now I would like to really take something with me and say, wow, what are the three things that I need to do on a daily basis, which of course you are a conscious leader. What are the things that you're doing on a regular basis that help you keep your equanimity in the midst of all the disaster. Yeah. And I mean, yeah. you guys survived Trump for four years. <laughs> what did you do? <laughs> uh, we did too, but. Um, well, uh, for me, I mean, a big part of, for me, what allows me to survive and all, I, I think this is part of what it, it is. It, it goes also back to my previous book is this, you know, is a sense of, of history and and a sense of the, how history has evolved, you know, all, in, how the culture has evolved, and and I know that sounds abstract, but what it gives me is a kind of an opt, a, a long term optimism, you know, uh, about what's possible. And there's no guarantees, you know. We might things might fall apart, things might fall apart for a period of time in all kinds of ways before they get better, and that's fine. We're going to try to make sure that doesn't happen, but there's all kinds of ways in which things could go off the rails. But there's a kind of a you know, I, sometimes I feel people live in this 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 worldview where things aren't very good, and there's no sense that they're getting better. There's no sense of the improvement of the human condition over time. And there are some worldviews that don't have don't uh, don't give you any sense that the human condition has improved over the last hundred years or five hundred years or a thousand years. And I don't buy that at all. I think oh, that's they, they should not- buy my book. Chapter <laughs> one is about the. <laughs> Achievements of humanity. There you go. Right. So, and I honestly think that gives you a lot of faith, you know, in the future, not the kind of faith that just makes you passive, but the kind of faith that allows you to sort of ride the waves of, of disappointment and struggle and difficulty in a, com- with a completely different context. And I honestly think that part of being a, yeah, so part of being a conscious leader and part of being an evolutionary is having that sense of that that larger trajectory that we're contributing to, you know, and we're trying to work to contribute to, but it's, it's far outside of our control or, or, you know, as well. And, but, but it, it gives us, we need that faith, you know, because I always say when you don't have faith in the evolution of culture, that culture can evolve and will evolve. And that in some small way we can contribute to it in our own very, in our own meager way, in our own humble way. If you don't have that faith, what you do, tend to do, is you reach for revolutionary solutions. You reach for, you, you don't try to evolve the system, you try to overthrow the system. And I see way too much of that in our society, people trying to overthrow the system, because they don't have that faith in the future. It, it, the, 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 the reaching for revolutionary, dramatic super idealistic it can take the form of super idealistic solutions it often is a lack of faith in the power of culture to evolve which sometimes translates to lack of faith in our own ability to evolve as well that we can see we can we can develop and change and and culture itself can develop and change so when you get that when you get that at a deep level man it's transformative it's it's a it's powerful because because it just gives you again it's not it doesn't make you passive it gives you it gives a kind of hope and a, and a confidence and a, and a sense of possibility. It opens up the future. 
it doesn't close it down. So, but I think there's something, there's an analogy at the, at the, at the personal level too. I do think the, the journey of a conscious leader, you ask it more practice, you know, the first step uh, overwhelmingly is, and it's the last chapter in the book. You know, we talked about put purpose first is the first chapter in the book, all about purpose and profits and things. The last chapter is equally important and it's called, it's continuous learn and grow. And, and that commitment to take up one's own developmental journey, to not be a passive participant or passive observer of one's own life, you know, <laughs> but, but to take the, you know, the in America, the bull by the horns, they say, to take, to take up the journey of learning and growth. And, and we talk about learning and growth as two different things, you know, learning can be very co cognitive, intellectual, and we all need to, you know, co cognitively expand ourselves and, and keep ourselves uh, awake and aware of what's going on in the world. And uh, so there's a, there's a, there's a journey of learning that's just a lifelong journey of learning. That's, that's essential, I think, for conscious leaders. But then the journey of growth too, to grow as individuals, to mature, to develop at a deeper level, at a psycho-emotional level, at maybe a level of consciousness, to, to become aware of our, own, of our own downsides, of our own shadows, of the ways in which we're inhibiting our, our own. And that sometimes takes work that's not intellectual. It, it, takes, it may take therapy, it may take uh, uh, taking up a, a, a spiritual practice it may take some meditation. It may take working with other people. It may take, uh, you know, it may take all kinds of things. It takes a deeper kind of awakening. It takes a deeper kind of, it's a different kind of journey. And there's all kinds of ways we can take it. I can't tell people how to take it, but there are all kinds of methods and methodologies for, for learning more about ourselves. So we don't get in our own ways. So we become more powerful, uh, you know, more powerful people and more, and more awake people, more humble people, more, you know, we, and there's just, there's so many things you could talk about in terms of that. So to me, that's the overwhelming message. If I, if there's any message to give a conscious leader is to take up that journey and take up that journey with, with great, you know, intensity and desire, because you'll become a better person and you'll become a better leader and you'll become, a, um, you know, it's like the journey of growth is something that we'll look back on our lives and, and it's something we can be, we can appreciate and, and take heart in and kind of be proud of in, in a way that that's very different than, than we can be proud of our achievements. You know, it's, it's it, who we become in the process of our lives is, is so is, you know, is as important if not much more important than what we do. And, and, and we can look at who we become. And that journey is about who we become. Which is why we're called human beings and not human, do, human doings. <laughs> right, there you go, right. <laughs> so where, where can people go from, uh, to learn more from, from about your work? Uh, can you give us a, an insight? Yes, uh, so they can, of course, they can get the book, Conscious Leadership. Uh, uh, CarterPhipps.com is my, my website. And... Uh, uh, you know, I have a podcast now, which people can listen to that uh, covers all kinds of topics, but including these. Um, uh, you mentioned my earlier book, Evolutionaries, and in the Institute for Cultural Evolution, people can go to culturalevolution.org, and that's more on focused on politics. In particular, that one's on American politics, but overcoming, overcoming political polarization and trying to figure out and understand how we kind of get our country moving forward in a more win-win context. Well, wonderful. Thank you so very much for, uh, for a very insightful and uh, passionate and uh, brilliant uh, description of your work and of your latest book. I'm, um, I'm deeply honored. Thank you so much for oh, being thanks, on the program. Thanks so much. I appreciate it. What a wonderful thing. <laughs>